reading to you the passage of scripture that we're going to be talking about the faith of the American founders. And I'm going to give you a little introduction. The passage of scripture we're going to be working from, brothers and sisters, is Psalm 11, verses 3. And it comes to us as a question. The question that David asks us is this. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And basically what he's saying here in this question is simply this. Our true foundation in America is the Judeo-Christian foundation. No matter what the last president said or any other person before him said, this nation was not founded on Hinduism, was not founded on Buddhism, was not founded on Islam. It was not founded on secular humanism. It was founded on the Judeo-Christian foundation. So we tell anybody who wants to tell us different, don't get it twisted, baby. I'm going to read to you out of my Bible here a commentary based on that scripture. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Jedediah Morse, 1761 to 1826, was the pioneer, American educator, clergyman, geographer, and the father of Samuel Morse, who invented the telegraph and the Morse code. While at Yale University, Jedediah studied for the ministry. And in 1789, he accepted a call to the first church of Charlestown, Massachusetts, one of the oldest churches in America. He was highly alarmed by how far the Boston clergy had moved away from doctrinal orthodoxy as well as by the growing influence of European rationalism in the United States. So therefore, in 1799, he preached an insightful election sermon. See, so this nonsense about separation of church and state going all the way back when the American church began to slide to the left because of the influence of the Enlightenment and rationalism mixed with the Judeo-Christian heritage, Jedediah preached what was called an election sermon. And he used the text that I just read to you all, that if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And in that sermon, he said these words. Listen closely. Our dangers are of two kinds, which affect our religion and affects our government. Uh-oh, that knocks that separation of church and state in the head right there. He says, they are, however, so closely allied, allied that they cannot be separated. The foundations which support the interests of Christianity are also the foundations necessary, necessary to support a free and equal government like our own. He says, to the kindly influence of Christianity, we owe that degree of civil freedom and political and social happiness which mankind now enjoys in America. In proportion to the genuine effects of Christianity are diminished in any nation, including our own, either through the sin of unbelief or the sin of corruption of its doctrine or the sin of the neglect of its institutions in that same proportion will the people of that nation recede from the blessings of genuine freedom and approximate the miseries of despotism ouch then he says i hold this to be a truth confirmed by my own experience. And if so, it then follows that all efforts made, listen guys, to destroy the foundations of our holy religion will ultimately tend to be also the subversion of our political freedom and happiness. Ouch. Finally, he says, whenever the pillars and the foundations of Christianity shall be overthrown, our present Republican form of government and all the blessings which flow from them 
must also fall together. I can stop right there and sit down. Because we see exactly what's happening in our nation. We've been hearing it for years. Oh, there's got to be a separation between church and state. Eh, yeah, baby, show me that in the First Amendment. They know it's not there. But they keep saying it. There's an old saying, if you tell a lie long enough, and with enough so-called sincerity, I put that in quotes, people will believe it. A lot of you campers who were here in years gone by would hear me say, when people would say, oh, you Christians, you haters. Uh-huh. Somebody who's been here with Reverend Craft over the years. What did Reverend Craft tell you the real definition of a hater? Come on, somebody. Talk to Rev. Yes, son. Someone who doesn't like the truth. Uh-huh. Give me the, do you know the exact, does that, come on. If you hate the truth, you love a lot. Ah, oh, there it is. The true haters are those who hate the truth because they love the lie. Hello, somebody. So when people try to hit you with a flim flam and tell you, are oh, you a Christ? You're a hater. Because you hate us because we believe in gender identity. Well, you can be a man in the morning and a woman in the afternoon and a combination of both by midnight. <laughs> The devil is a liar. I told some of you a couple years ago, I had to do a talk down at Richard Stockton a College in South Jersey. When I got done with the talk, I opened it up for question and answer. Some young man stood up and said, well, Reverend, what do you think about transgenderism? I said, I don't think about it at all because it's a bold-faced lie. There is no sex thing. He got offended. They hadn't invited me back since. <laughs> eh? I said, I'll tell you what, sir, I see you're offended because I see your mouth turning up and your eyes rolling in your head. I said, but before I let you get out of here, I'm going to ask you a question. I said, look at me. What do you see? He didn't say anything. I said, answer me. What do you say? Oh, we see you, Reverend Craft. I said, no, you don't see me. Don't you believe your lying eyes? You see a white man trapped in a black man's body. <laughs> That's the exact response I got from them. You know why that response came forth? Because common sense tells you that if you can believe that you are whatever you think you are, rather than what you really are, baby, you need some help up in here. <laughs> I said, that's like me saying, oh, I don't, Reverend Kraft doesn't have any money, but I believe and I feel that I'm a millionaire. So I'm gonna go to Chase Bank and say, give me my money, honey. <laughs> doesn't work that way. Reality does not change based on what I think. If I believe a lie, I'm a hater. Not because I believe a lie, I'm a hater because I hate the truth, because I love the lie. Hello, somebody. Amen. So from now on, all of us up in here, don't let the devil intimidate you through people when they want to tell you what you a hater. Because you believe in that old straight and narrow gospel. Yeah, the gospel is straight and is narrow. And Jesus said only a few find it. Will we be one of the few that find the truth and reject the lie? So, we're going to go through this presentation. We hear a lot of talk about MAGA. The acronym Make America Great Again. We know our president got elected on that theme. It's a good thing, but it's not deep enough. It doesn't go far enough. Because we have to ask what we have to ask ourselves, just how are we going to mock it? How are we going to make America great again? And the answer is righteousness. Psalms, I mean Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts a nation or makes a nation great. But sin is a reproach to any people. There's no secular way to make America great again without God. All right? 
Yeah? We hear the term American exceptionalism. That's a good term. Why is America exceptional? Again, the, pure, the, the principle is foundational and it's spiritual. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. There is why we're exceptional. Because our God is the God of Scripture. So we cannot get away, away brothers and sisters, from the spiritual principles that make this foundation. Because if we lose our belief and our trust in God, we're going to get just the opposite and we'll lose our nation. So don't let anybody tell you that we got to keep the gospel separate from our government beliefs and our politics. That's a lie straight out the pits of hell. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the faith of the father, of the founders. And obviously, none of us except God knows exactly how many of them were born again. We don't know that. There's no way to know. Only God knows that. But what we do know is that they all had a Christian foundation. That we do know. So we can speak to that. So we'll be speaking more to their foundation, which was correct. And the quotes that they said out of their mouth, which we then can assume that they had a knowledge of God, even though, like Morse said here, a lot of it got mixed with European rationalism through the Enlightenment. So let's go through this. Why isn't this? Uh, oh, never mind. Okay, okay, hold on. Okay, I saw. It just went back. Let me, let me, uh, let me go back. Okay, let's, let's start again. Okay, faith of America's founders. Today, can anybody see? Yeah, yeah okay, let me, because I, I don't want to uh, block. Today, people talk about the separation of church and state and, keep Christ and keeping Christianity and prayer out of the schools. But few people realize that many of America's founders were devote, devoutly Christian. People such as George Washington, Abigail and John Adams, Patrick Henry knew that God was important to the founding of this country and to its future. Not only did they base their decisions on biblical principles, see that's good right there, but they staked the future of the United States of America on its citizens' ability to govern themselves under the kingship of Jesus Christ. Oh, I thought we were supposed to have separation of church and state. That knocks that mess in the head right there. Benjamin Franklin said, I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire, huh, USA, can rise without his aid? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, remember? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings, that's the Bible, that except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. You see why secular humanism is so dangerous? I firmly believe this, Benjamin Franklin said. And I also believe that without his concurrent aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of battle. Wow, that was Benjamin Franklin. But yet we're going to listen to these rascals today that wants to tell us something else? We're going to believe somebody. <laughs> Benjamin Rush. Now, this is really prophetic. Look what Benjamin Rush said. By removing the Bible from schools, we would be wasting so much time and money in punishing criminals and so little pains to prevent crime. Ouch. Take the Bible out of our schools and there would be an explosion in crime. That man was a prophet. The Bible's out of school, am I right? But murder is in the school. Hello, somebody. Do you see why Reverend Kraft doesn't bite his tongue and back up off them liars? That man would turn over in his grave if he was to come back from the dead. Yeah, I know. I got to find the, uh, what you got? Um, remember to check the checkbox. Yeah, I got it. Next. William Bradford said in 1647, he didn't say this in 2017, he said in 1647, look what he said. In 1647, you all, 
How many of you were around in 1647? <laughs> Uh-oh, watch yourself, son. Last, last and not least, they cherish the great hope and inward zeal of laying good foundations. We just call the foundation. Or at least making some ways toward it for the propagation and advancement of the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in the remote parts of the world even though they should be but stepping stones to others in performance of such a great work. John Adams, second president, listen what he said. Suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book. Suppose there was no books except the Bible. And every member in that nation would regulate his conduct by the precepts that were there exhibited in that book. Every member, listen to this, y'all, this stuff's heavy. This is the second president of the United States saying this. Every member would then be obliged in his conscience to temperance, frugality, and industry. Also to justice, kindness, and charity toward his fellow man, and to piety, love, and reverence toward Almighty God. What a utopia, what a paradise that would be in this region. Now, obviously, we know because we're all born sinful that there's no way that that could happen. But think about it. If every human being in America followed that principle and did what the Bible said, we wouldn't have to worry about terrorism. We wouldn't have to worry about no same sex. We wouldn't have to worry about none of this madness, corruption, none of that. It wouldn't exist. The reason why we have all these problems in America is because sin has taken away the, our right thinking about the idea of right and wrong. And where did this idea come from? Well, you can decide for yourself what's right and wrong. You know where that idea came from? Satan. And what was the first time he used it? With Eve? Where? In the garden? With Adam standing right there watching? Eve? You mean to tell me God told you and your husband that you could eat of every tree in the garden except one? Oh, Eve, come on now. You seem to be a reasonable woman. Uh-huh. God's really trying to trick you, baby girl. Because God knows if you eat that tree, you're going to be just like him. And you'll be able to figure out for yourself, baby girl, what's good and what's evil. That lie still works. Uh-huh. Don't tell me how to live my life. This is my life, Reverend Cry. I can figure out for myself what's right and what's wrong. Uh-huh. Guess what? Who told you that? The devil told it to you. In the Garden of Eden. <laughs> John Adams also said, we have no government that is armed with power, that's capable of contending with human passions, that is unbridled by morality and religion, average, that's, that's greed, ambition, revenge, or the opposite, gallantry, would do what? Would break the strongest courts of our Constitution as a whale goes through a neck. That's, that's powerful. Our Constitution is designed only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for any other. That's why these rascals, I told some of the young people yesterday, I said these rascals get elected and they have to take their oath, they got their, their hand behind their back with their fingers crossed. I, I, I swear to obey the Constitution. They lie as soon as they open their mouth. <laughs> And then what they do, I told the young people, they put their left hand on the Bible, the left hand on the Bible, and they raise their right hand. You know what they're really saying when they do that? They're saying, I suppress the word of God with my left hand, and I raise my right hand to say, I am my own God. When in fact they should say, I lift up the word of God and my left hand I keep down at my side. They know what they're doing. That's why they put their left hand on top of the Bible. Because they're suppressing the truth to believe a lie. 
He goes on to say, statesmen, my dear sir, may plan and they may speculate for liberty, but it is religion and morality alone which can establish the principles upon which freedom can securely stand. You see how freedom and religion and morality tie together? Mm -hmm. eh? The only foundation of a free constitution is pure virtue. And if this cannot be inspired into our people in a greater measure than they have it now, they may change their rulers and the forms of their government, but they will not obtain a lasting liberty. Now that was the second president of the United States. He's saying, I don't care what kind of constitution we have. We might as well try to hold a whale in a fishing net if the people are wicked. Now that's powerful, y'all. You know, good mother, you can't hold or restrain a whale with a net. Yet we have a constitution, we've had one constitution in the United States. But they don't believe it. And they, they say, they make the lie out their mouth that they're gonna uh, 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 support it and obey it when they know they're lying. Why? Because the devil has deceived people and has taken away the true foundation which stands on the word of God. Patrick Henry, now listen to this one. What he said is really, we always hear, give me liberty or give me death. But we don't read a lot of his other writings. Listen to what he said. Now you're talking about politically incorrect, but yet biblically correct. Look what Patrick Henry said. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation, talking about the United States, was founded. Uh-oh, here it comes, y'all. This is getting killed if he say this today. Not by religionists, in other words, not by Buddha, not by Hare Krishna, not by Allah, not by the Swami, uh -huh. not by Deus, not by religionists, but by Christians. Ouch! Not on religions. Allah, Islam, sit down. Buddha, sit down. Hare Hare Krishna, sit down. But on the gospel of Christ Jesus. And for this very reason, now listen to this, what Patrick Henry said. For this very reason, people of other faiths, those are no religions I just said, have been afforded asylum. That's why the rest of Jesus come over here. Prosperity and freedom of worship here. In other words, because of the freedom that God gives us through the everlasting gospel, which is the only true faith, false religions have the freedom to come here and spout lies. Try going over North Korea or going over to uh, 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 the Middle East where I got to go in a couple weeks. Saudi Arabia and in places and talking about you want to preach. Guess what? But yet, false religions can come to America, set up shop, build temples, mosques, and everything else, plant Buddha, and everything else. Why? Because the gospel gives us freedom to believe the truth, or the gospel gives us freedom to believe a lie. Oh, help Reverend Craft, y'all. Help me, y'all. Help me up in here. Bad men, and I'll include bad women in this, <laughs> cannot make good citizens. I think that makes common sense. It is when, listen guys, it is when a people forget God that tyrants forge their chains. There it is right there. Has nothing to do with a lot of this political flim flam they trying to sell you about this this uh, uh, issue and that issue and this issue and that issue. Like you heard the brothers, the, the presenters say yesterday, it's all a game. It's all part of a bigger agenda. Get rid of the truth and make the people believe a lie so that you can bring them into bondage. Eh? A habituated state of morals 
a corrupted public conscience is incompatible with freedom. You see why we're losing our freedom? We're losing our freedom because of the spiritual corruption that was initiated by sin. So we got to get back, brothers and sisters, to the spiritual foundations that's bringing this mess on. There's no way other way to do it. You can't legislate this mess. Again, he said, Patrick Henry, he said, whether this will prove a blessing or a curse will depend upon the use our people make of the blessings which a gracious God has bestowed on us. There it is again. There is make America great again. If they are wise, they will be great and happy. See, the word great, he even said it. Our president, Donald Trump, he probably read this thing. If they are of a contrary character, in other words, if they're wicked, they will be miserable. Righteousness alone can exalt them as a nation. See, he quoted Proverbs uh, of 1434 right there. Reader, whoever you are, remember this. And in thy sphere, practice virtue thyself in encouraging others. See, all these people were what we call today politically incorrect. Yet they are the founders. So where does lie come from? That you got to keep the gospel in the building. Don't tell nobody. Keep it private. Reverend, don't wear your religion on your shirt sleeves. Baby, I got a short sleeve shirt on. I, my religion ain't got nothing to do with my sleeve on my shirt. <laughs> my religion is a relationship with the only true and living God, baby. Don't get it twisted. And it's not on my shirt sleeve. It's in my heart. See, that's the way you got to talk to these people. Because they think you're scared of them. They think you don't know anything. But see, one thing about us old people, you know, a lot of you guys know, I'm 73 years old. <laughs> I'm almost getting ready to go to heaven. <laughs> Only thing they can do is send me there a little quicker. <laughs> eh? <laughs> but you young people now, if the Lord will tarry, we got to pass the baton to you. Are you going to have the faith to stand up for the truth? Or are you going to back down and say, ooh, I can't say that. They, they, they'll get offended. Oh. Snowflake. <laughs> Snowflakes and cupcakes are safe space. The only safe space any of us have is in Christ. The Bible says that the, 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 the name of the Lord is on. Come, coward. The righteous run into that safe space and a safe. There's your safe space, y'all. Uh -huh. Samuel Adams said, the right of the colonists as Christians, they may be best understood by reading and carefully studying the institutes of the great lawgiver, that's the Bible, and the head of the Christian church, that's Christ, which are to be found clearly written and promulgated in the New Testament. Okay? There it is. Adams also says, we have this day restored the sovereign, that's God, to whom all men and women ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven. And from the rising to the setting of the sun, let his kingdom come. Uh-huh. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth, where we are, as it's already established in heaven. Reverend Kraft can motivate us to do anything and it's this don't get the cart before the horse don't get it twisted our problem at its root is spiritual not political not economic not social spiritual we get the spiritual right the rest will line up we don't get the spiritual right we can forget the rest of it it'll never work that's why we have to be bold with our beliefs and our faith. William Prescott says, we consider that we are all embarked in the same boat and must sink or swim together. Prescott then said, let us all be of one heart and let us stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. He got that out of 1 Corinthians. And may he, or 2 Corinthians, and may he of his infinite mercy Grant us deliverance of all our troubles. 
These are all f founders, y'all. So where does lie come from to keep it separate and keep it in the building? Hancock. John Hancock. His, what he started went off in the field. But look what he said. In circumstances as dark as these. See, it was getting crazy back then. It becomes us as men, women, and Christians to reflect that while every prudent measure should be taken to ward off the impending judgments, see this has been going on a long time, y'all. At the same time, all confidence must be withheld from the means we use and reposed only on that God rules in the armies of heaven. And without his whole blessing, the best human counsels are but foolishness and all created power vanity. You hear what he's saying there? He's saying you remove God, and I don't care if you have 10 PhDs from Harvard, MIT, or wherever, it's all vain and pure foolishness and pure nonsense. For unless the Lord builds the house, the, la the laborers build it in vain. Nothing secular will work. Nothing that takes God out the picture will work. And the devil and his wicked people know that. John Witherspoon said, while we give praise to God, the supreme disposer of all events. For his interposition on our behalf, let us guard against the dangerous error, listen guys, of trusting in or boasting of an arm of flesh, in other words, people. If your case is just, in other words, if what you say is right, if your principles are pure, that the gospel, and if your conduct is prudent, that means you're living with virtue and holiness, you do not need to, to fear the multitude of opposing hosts. You know what he's saying here? You get your heart right with God. Keep it right with God. Keep looking up and don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. Look up to Jesus. Guess what? It makes no difference how many wicked people or how many wicked governments, ISIS coming from afar or wicked enemies within our country, domestic enemies. He says, and he got that out the Bible, that we have an invisible host of heaven that are fighting on our behalf. And we will not lose. But that's a principle you all, we, we got to believe. And you got to believe it in your heart, not just in your head. Witherspoon also said, listen to this, nothing is more certain than that a general public what I, that word is a tongue question. And corruption of manners make a people ripe for destruction. A good form of government, listen to this, a good form of government, that's us, a constitutional republic. But listen to what Witherspoon said. May hold the rotten materials together for some time, but beyond a certain pitch, even the best constitution, our constitution, will be ineffectual. We see that right now. So now they're calling for Article 5. Like that's, like that's going to fix something. And slavery must ensue. On the other hand, when the manners of a nation are pure, when true religion and internal principles maintain their vigor, the attempts of the most powerful enemies to oppress them are commonly baffled and disappointed. John Witherspoon then said that he is the best friend to American liberty who is most sincere and active in promoting true and undefiled religion. So if there's true and undefiled religion, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, then that means the opposite's also true. There is false and defiled religion. And who sets himself up with the greatest firmness to bear down on profanity and immorality of every kind? Then he says, listen to this, y'all. Whoever is an avowed enemy of God, I scruple not to call him an enemy of his country. 
ouch, when I when I saw that one, when I made that slide, I said, that's, that's, that's hitting hard. You know what he's saying? He's saying, don't tell me that you're an atheist, that you hate God. You claim God doesn't exist. Well, if you really believe God doesn't exist, what you're hating something that doesn't exist for. Why are you fighting something that's non-existent? I don't see you setting up an organization to fight Santa Claus. <laughs> you say God doesn't exist, but yet you go out of your way to fight something that doesn't exist. Spend millions of dollars to fight a spook. <laughs> no, you know God exists. The Bible tells you. The fool in his heart has said there's no God. The Bible says every human being knows there's a supreme being because God has written that in our hearts. No, you know God exists, but you don't want to submit to God because you want to do your thing. He says here, don't say that you're an atheist and you're a patriot. That's an oxymoron. If you're an atheist, you hate God that you claim doesn't exist. Guess what? You hate your country. You know why? Because your country was founded on God. Hello, somebody. Ouch. Hey. Every one of us in here heard, oh, I'm an atheist, but I'm a patriot. You're a lying wonder. John Quincy Adams said, the highest glory of the American Revolution is this, that it connected in one indissoluble bond the principles of civil government there's your government with the principles of, of, of Christianity I thought there was a separation there's none of course there's none George Washington said of all the dispositions first uh, president of all the dispositions <coughs> excuse me which lead to political prosperity religion and morality are indispensable supports in vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. He said what Witherspoon just said. He says, you can't claim to be a patriot, you can't claim to love America, and yet you hate God and hate his gospel. Now that's powerful, y'all. Because you're going to hear a lot of people today, the 21st century, tell you just the opposite. So now what are you going to believe? You're going to believe what George Washington said? Which George Washington said what Witherspoon said? And what Washington and Witherspoon said what the Bible says? The Bible says you are a fool if you say God does not exist. Because you know God exists. But you don't want to serve God. Because if you really believe God did not exist, if you really believe that, you wouldn't pay it a bit of mind. You just say, oh, them Christians, they're crazy. They, believe, they might as well believe in a good two fairy. But no. Atheistic organizations spring up. They spend millions, literally millions of dollars to fight Christians. But yet they say, there's no God. There's something wrong with that picture, y'all. How many more minutes I got, Josh? My watch, I'm, I, run a little, I always keep my watch a little fast. Okay, I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready because I, I got more slides, but I'm going to cut this thing short. Admiring and thankfully acknowledging the riches of redeeming love and earnestly imploring that divine assistance which may enable us to live no more to ourselves but to him who loved us and gave himself to die for us. I'm going to stop right there and wrap this, put a wrap on this thing because I, I'm a stickler for time. And when I know my 45 minutes is up because you guys need your break and then we have... This is White coming up, so I'm going I'm to wrap this thing. Can, can, Mr. can Reverend Craft wrap it? Yes. Yeah. You sure you want me to wrap it? Yeah. I'm going to wrap it. Whoa. I think I made my case. Somebody told me years ago, Rev, if God hadn't called you to preach, you'd be a good uh, lawyer. I said, yeah. I said, I said, oh, yeah, I'd work him. I said, I'd work him. I work them from both sides. I work them from the prosecuting side and I work them from the defense side. I said, but God didn't call me to be a lawyer. Oh, Lord, he called me to be a preacher. I said, but I'll tell you what he did do. He gave me that boy right there, my grandson. His mama is a lawyer. Ha! So I got it anyhow. And that's my grandson. His mama is a lawyer. Eh? So God gave me, gave me a little blessing on the QT anyhow. <laughs> through, through his mama, our baby girl. 
So in closing, y'all, I got I have more slides, but I'm gonna stop right there. I think you got my drift. Come on up, Mr. Shirley. The bottom line is simply this, y'all. You can either believe the truth of what the founders told us about MAGA, how do we make America great again? We're not gonna make America great again based on secular, humanistic, atheistic, agnostic thinking. It's a lie. Their agenda is to take God and the gospel and the Bible out of your heart. That's why they got rid of prayer in school. That's why they get rid of the Bible. That's why they got rid of the Ten Commandments. That's why they keep trying to, they're pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. What we got to do, brothers and sisters, is push back. And we got to push back with conviction. We got to let them know, no baby, enough's enough. This stuff is getting crazier by the minute. When are we going to stand up and say, I'm not going in the closet? You going back in the closet with that madness. <laughs> They're going to put Christians in the closet and bring every pervert out the closet. Right. Yeah. Right. Hey, hey, I'm, I ain't rolling like that. You ain't putting me in no, no gospel closet. All right, so here's the measure, y'all. One of the things, one of the visions the Lord many years ago gave me and Mr. Sherliff was to see the camp expanded. And one thing God put in my heart just in the last, I don't know, I don't know, man. Well, that was before you were even born. Before our son was born, and he's 38 now, was to believe God to get a small motor home. Uh, class B, the small one. And then began to do many camps around the country. What we do here all week, take it to a place, share these, these truths from the founders, do a weekend program, a mini camp, go to another town, do the same thing, Go to another town. For example, we live in Jersey, so I'd take that truck. Me and Mrs. Kraft would go to, say, Philly, park that thing in front of the Liberty Bell, do a program right there. She'd talk to the little ones. I'd talk to the grown-up folks. Do a little seminar. Lead there. Boom. Go to another town. Do the same thing. Boom. Go to another town. End up all the way in the West Coast, in Los Angeles. Go to Azusa Street, where the revival was. Cause see, I'm an evangelist. I'm a revivalist. And at the same time, doing that, doing a well a round robin all over the country, doing many seminars on constitutional and American principles, talking about camp constitution. So I want you guys' prayers that God will make that happen. You all get something out of this? Yeah. Amen. Come on.